Parliament Square, the procession enters the most historic part of the Royal Route, past Big Ben, past Westminster Hall and the Houses of Parliament, to the ancient Church of Westminster, which was first built in the days of Edward the Confessor, whose crown will, before another hour has passed, rest on the head of King George VI. This morning there were seven separate processions taking their ways to the Abbey. Now they have joined into one amazing line of colour, more than two and a half miles long. Among its fitting uniforms and waiting through, not the smallest corner, not the least citizen of the Empire is forgotten. Not one branch of its sight is unrepresented. <laughs> the Trafalgar Square again, and then the procession passes from some of the most famous streets in the city. And at this moment, as the state coach draws up at the Abbey, we remember other coronations that have passed. Now, once again, the sovereign comes to the throne, fitted by character and upbringing, to carry on a great tradition. <laughs> Traffic jam, is it? <laughs> no, we're here. 16A, first floor. All right. Now, mind your door. All right, all right. Boys up. Nice day for coronation, isn't it? <laughs> I love to see them old Chelsea pensioners, don't you? It's <laughs> no uniform, don't I? Oh, come on, let's get started then. Clarence. Who's there? <laughs> Thought I'd nip off for an hour. Have a look at the procession. You what? I'll be back before you have time to brew up. Yeah. You get started with the packing and I'll take over with the heavy stuff. You royal leg swinging sky boy. You're going to leave me here all on my own? Clarence, face up to it. Where's the sense in you going to have a look at their majesties? You can't even see past the far side of your specs. There ain't nothing wrong with my eyesight. No, Clarence. I have you know, I have the eyesight of a eagle. <laughs> I only wear these glasses for reading. Now listen to me. We're going to get that furniture out of the house. We're going to drive it to Southampton like we agreed. If you try and walk off the job, you lazy sky, I'll knock your block off. Have you got that? I said, have you got that? Oh, go on, go on in, sulk, sulk. <laughs> Anyone would think you were the only girl in the world with a broken engagement. And don't be emotional when there's a servant present. Oh, really? Bad business showing one's feelings in front of servants. I remember when poor Deirdre Playfair's husband hanged himself. He got his valets to hold the ladder. Well, of course, none of us went to the funeral. <laughs> Never mind. Seeing the coronation will cheer you up. Are you looking forward to it, Travers? After all, it is a holiday for the working class people as well, isn't it? Not that you've got a holiday, of course, but that can't be helped, can it? Yes, madam. I mean, no, madam. I, I mean, that is... Uh, no, it can't be helped, and yes, I am looking forward to it. The street looks lovely, all decorated. Yes, don't go on about it, Travers. That's the trouble with servants. Give them half a chance, they stand and gossip all day. Personally, I think the decoration's frightfully vulgar. The colours are dreadful. You can't choose colours for a coronation, Mother. It has to be red, white and blue. I still think it could be occasionally possible to veer towards the violet and the cerise. However, as the servants are responsible for putting them up, one could scarcely expect anything approaching taste. What are those ragged-looking children building the bonfire? And that's another thing I don't approve of. Allowing the servants' children to build that monstrosity. If the wind changes, we shall all be burnt in our beds. We won't be in our beds tonight, Mother. Well, it'll all be on the furniture van. Oh, don't be so pedantic, Angela. It's an expression like love makes the world go round. Which reminds me, Travers, no followers while we are out. No, no, madam. <laughs> ah, that'll be the removers at last. Well, answer it, Travers. Yes, madam. Are you the removals? Yes, madam. Which way? No, I'm not, madam. I'm Travers. Well, do come in. They've been waiting for you. Right. Not going to the coronation. Are you mad? I'm going to wait here in case Geoffrey telephones. If you don't see the procession, how will you dare to face your grandchildren? If Geoffrey doesn't telephone me, I'm not likely to have any grandchildren. <laughs> The removals, persons. Where are the others? Uh, oh, he's in the van. Oh. Uh, I trust you know what you have to do. 
Everything in this flat must be in Southampton by midnight. I shall drive it there myself, ma'am. We shall return here at six for our personal effects. Travers will point them out to you, and they are not to be removed. Now, leave it to me, ma'am. And take particular care of my porcelain. Oh, yes, I'll treat it like me own, ma'am. Some of it was once owned by the Duke of Wellington. Oh, and you bought it when they pulled it down, did you? <laughs> they didn't uh, pull down the Duke of Wellington. They buried him. Oh, I see. Oh, I thought you meant a pub, see. <laughs> A uh, public house, madam. I don't know what a pub is. Thank you, Travers. I'm not entirely ignorant of working-class phraseology. I trust you are not a frequenter of pubs, my good man. Me? Oh, no, ma'am, no. No, because I don't want a disappearing act for an hour and a half at lunchtime and coming back the worse for drink. Oh, no, no. I'm never the worse for drink, no. I'm sometimes the better for it. <laughs> drink makes me amorous. Precisely. Travers... I hope you're taking note of all this. Oh, yes, madam. I'm leaving you alone with this person. And I expect you to behave in a ladylike fashion, even though you're not one. <laughs> if there is the slightest hint of any nonsense, you will be severely reprimanded. I never stand for nonsense. Oh, what do you do? Lie down. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, I said uh, there's a box or two to tie down. A uh, tie up on it. <laughs> I'll have to get some uh, rope from the van uh, soon. And I want the flat left spotlessly clean for the incoming tenant. Now, Angela, we're going. I'm going to wait here a bit in case Jeffrey telephones. Well, if you miss the procession, it's your own funeral. She won't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the trunk and the suitcases are going with the master and mistress of Rangoon. They aren't to be touched. All right, oh. I'll just move this uh, standard lamp out of my way. Do it, put me down. Who's this then? It's Miss Angela. Do please put her down. Oh. She's going through an unhappy time. Oh dear. I'm sorry. No harm done. I was just guessing your weight. Nine stone five. I'm never wrong. I'm used to lifting wardrobes, you see. Travers, if the telephone rings, I shall be locked in my bedroom. Yes, miss. <coughs> Anybody else here? No, just us. Oh, because people hide, you know. They get dug in behind the curtains and under the sofa. <laughs> they pop up behind you, they think it's funny. Are you still here? Yes. Uh, not a bad little room, this, yeah. I've seen worse. What I do appreciate is a nice bit of chip and dough. Look at that, look at the grain in that. <laughs> here to help you. Well, Albert and me, we've got an arrangement, you see. I do the packing and he does the lifting, because the trouble with me is I'm too strong for lifting, see. I mean, you give me a billiard table, I'll knock chips off your ceiling. I'm built like a Brahma bull, I am. Feel them sides. Go on, feel them. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is that you? Yes. Huh. Oh, I like the look of you. Uh, normally, I don't go much for women, you know, they're too, uh, well, what's the word, uh, female. But uh, you've got good, strong lines on your face, you have. All over it. <laughs> you married? No. No, you keep it that way. You don't want to go making some poor bloke's life hell. <laughs> I can respect a woman who dies single and miserable, you know. I was engaged once. Oh, yeah. What happened? He ran off with another woman. <laughs> You won't laugh when I tell you. <laughs> he ran off with another man. <laughs> well, that's nice, I must say. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I, I was coughing a laugh. I was, I was gassed in the war. <laughs> oh, dear me. Don't you think you'd better get on with your work? Yeah, I'm going to, but don't go away. You cheer me up, you do. <laughs> oh, ran off with another man, eh? <laughs> right, come on in. Where's this porcelain, then? It's over there. Over where? Look! <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there he is, forcing all right. Yeah. Oh, look at that. My old granny had a piece just like that. It's lovely, isn't it? You will be careful, won't you? Careful? I've got hands like a surgeon, me. What's that? Oh, I cut myself. <laughs> Well, it's all right. I don't go much for it myself, you know. I find it's a bit too, well, it's too namby-pamby for me, like. Ooh, you mustn't say that to madam. According to her, it's very choice. Yeah. Of course, it's all right for her. She doesn't have to dust it. 
Well, it's all according whether you like it or not, really, isn't it, eh? I, uh, I nearly went into the quality china business once. Oh? You interested in good china? No, that's why I never went into it. <laughs> I see. Right, listen, here we go, then. <laughs> that's it. That's got the job started, isn't it, eh? Oh, yeah. Must be dry right in them floorboards. <laughs> I should think you'd be glad to be leaving, wouldn't I? Look, will you please let me help you? Oh, I was waiting for that. I was just waiting for that. All women make up to me, you know. As soon as I start this sort of job, they all say, oh, please let me help you. Of course, the trouble is, you do a woman a favour, she wants tit for tat, doesn't she, eh? That's her trouble. I mean, she's, she sews a button on your shirt, you know, takes her a couple of tits. She calls it the best years of her life. <laughs> all right, then, if you want to help, get some more paper. Right. So we done it. <laughs> of course, the trouble is, you see, women will run after any old thing what's single. That's why I have to be doubly careful on account of my looks, you see. I mean, it's no joke being the splitting image of him. Who? Come off it. You know who I look like. Mind you, I never noticed it myself until I heard this woman on the bus say, Cool, don't he look like Spencer Tracy? <laughs> Spencer Tracy. Oh, you can see it in all, can you? <laughs> no, I can't. Not at all. Ah, uh, you're one of them cunning ones, ain't you? You're trying to intrigue me, ain't you? Certainly not. Oh, uh, yes, you are. Oh, I know you. Hey, here you are, then. Look, what about this, then? What about that? What about it? Well, Spencer Tracy, isn't it? Dr. Livingston, I presume, see? I mean, do you see the likeness now, then? No. All right, then. Yeah, what about this one? What about this one? Ronald Coleman, look. Ronald Coleman. Oh, I do like him. Yeah. So, who do I resemble, then? Charles Lawton. <laughs> if you're trying to infatuate me, my woman, you're going about the wrong way about this. <laughs> so, uh, where is this employer of yours going to then? Rangoon. Oh, yeah. Is that broad, is it? It's in the mysterious east. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You going too, and all I? No, no, I, I finished today. I was only temporary. Oh, yeah. I'm out of work at five o'clock. Oh. Well, of course, normally I wouldn't work on a coronation day, not even on a rust job like this, but when it comes to the upper classes, God bless them, I am their man. I mean, we've got to look after them. We've got to treat them right. They're the backbone of the country, they are. Right, you watch me now. <laughs> Half an hour's time, you're going to see an empty room here. Yeah? <laughs> right. Stop! Those are goldfish. Oh, oh yeah. Of course, that's another thing about you women, isn't it? You're all soft, aren't you, when it comes to animals? You're all soft. Go on. Flush them down the lab. Go on. I certainly will not flush them down the yeah, lab. Oh, here he comes now. Now we've done half the pack and he's turned up, ain't he? I don't know. All right, all right. Stop ringing that bell. That's the telephone. No, it's not a telephone. Oh, it's Jasmine. I'm coming, darling. I'm coming. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Where's what, miss? The telephone. You thought, what have you done with it? Well, it was there a minute. Well, here's the string. <laughs> you packed the telephone. Aye, aye. It's in there. Where, where, what, where? Oh, get it out, now. All right, get it out. I'll get it out, man. I'll get it out. <laughs> I don't know. Women can't seem to make their minds up, can they? First it's packed, then it's unpacked. Then it's packed, then it's unpacked. I mean, what's the point of being systematic about it all? I mean, what's it all for? Well, you hurry. Yes, I'm hurrying. Hold on, Jesse. <laughs> Yes, hold on, Jeffrey, we're coming. <laughs> What's it look like? What's it look like? <laughs> oh, oh, I got it, I got it, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm really good. Hang on, it's put on some rope. Jeffrey! Jeffrey! I can't hear you! Oh, no, I've got the other bit, sorry. Yeah. Oh, my God! <laughs> I think I'll kill myself. <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? That's very nice, isn't it? Disrupts me all day and doesn't even say please or thank you or kiss me foot. <laughs> oh, well, onward, ever onward. <laughs> I wish people wouldn't leave their slippers about. Right. Glassware next. Which way's the pantry? <laughs> Upon my knee, just me for two and two for me, just me for you and you for me alone. Nobody here, nobody here, no friend, no enemy. 
What on earth do you think you're doing? Hey. Well, I mean, what are you doing? You said you were only going to do the packing. Yeah, I know, but he's not here, is he? I mean, he swore on his mother's knickers to be here. <laughs> So where is he? I mean, someone's got to shift the stuff, haven't they? Where's the door gone? Here, it's this way. Oh, all right, all right. I'm not blind and you're not an Alsatian. Just point me, will you? <laughs> Straight ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah, all right. Right! Right! Well, we're getting on. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better wait for your friend? Wait? How can I wait? Expect this rubbish to walk to Southampton. Yeah, but you can't do it all on your own. When your friend comes He's back... He's no friend of mine, a rotten skiver. When he comes back, it'll be because the booze is shut, that's all. Yeah, what do you think? It's a joke. Leave it to poor old Clarence. They all say that. They all take advantage of me, you see. Because they think I'm a, you know, what do I call it? Perfectionist. Get out of it. <laughs> sit down and have some tea. There's no van to put the furniture in anyway. That's not my fault, is it? I'm going to dump all the furniture outside on the pavement. Then I'm going home to my hobby. Your hobby? What's that? Watch repairing. <laughs> is that tea, you say? <coughs> oh, well. Might as well. Might as well, as they say. Well, you really deserve it. <sighs> I've never seen a man work so hard. <laughs> That's a teapot. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed, I noticed, yeah. I was just examining a little crack in the spout there. <laughs> oh, it's funny, he hasn't got one. I usually have one of them. Oh, oh, Tar, yeah, Tar. Well, I don't envy his poor old majesty today, you know. Look at the country he's getting, eh? Nothing but lead swingers and women. <laughs> you ain't so bad. Oh, thank you. You going to Hong Kong too and all, then? Rangoon? No, I told you I've had my notice. Yeah. As of this evening, I shall have to find a new position. Oh, try standing up in hammock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are, of course. Yeah, I know I am. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> or swinging upside down from a gas lamp. Whee! What's on with you? <laughs> well, no, we shouldn't. Not on Coronation Day. <laughs> I don't often come over funny, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, I think I've done myself a mischief there. Perhaps it was that heavy chair. Yeah, yeah. You make lovely tea. Oh, do I? Mm. So you ain't going then, eh? They asked me to. Do you think I was wrong to refuse? No. No, you don't want to go living up that jungle. Don't I? Nah. Nothing up there but monkeys and coconuts. <laughs> Funny, you know, a woman said to me the other day that I reminded her of Tarzan. <laughs> you know, uh, Johnny Wisemuller, you know, him in the little skirt up the Odeon. There is a resemblance. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how many people I look like, isn't it, hun? <laughs> it's even more striking when I get my clothes off. So I'm sure. Yeah. Um... What's your name, then? Travers. Yeah, I know that. What's your first name? Oh, Jane. Oh, it's true. How are you, What? Well, you, Jane, me, Tarzan. <laughs> that proves it, doesn't it, That's eh? very good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've just come to one of my decisions. For you, I'm going to break the rules of a lifetime. I'm going to let you help me. With the parking? Uh, no. No, it's all done. No, I know that. No, I mean with the lifting. <laughs> well, I, I and don't... after that, we'll go and see the big bonfires for the coronation they built, shall we? They've got a wonderful big one up at Highgate. What, you'll take me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the last time I took a girl to see a bonfire was uh, Armistice Day. Nice girl she was. We used to call her Dirty Daphne. <laughs> what happened to her? 
Well, uh, <laughs> I took her down this laneway in Putney, you see, but no, I no, put... no, 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 I mean, afterwards. Oh, afterwards. <laughs> well, afterwards, I, uh, it was just about that time I got these new glasses, you see, <laughs> and so, uh, afterwards, I, uh, I took a good look at her. <laughs> My God, she was fat. <laughs> She was fat all over. Every bit of her was fat. Even her hair was fat. <laughs> so I never changed my glasses after that. Oh, oh that's sad. Mm. You're not uh, fat, though, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You're a bit thin, aren't you? Oh, is, is that good? Well, it's the next best thing to slender. <laughs> Let's get going. Where shall we start? Bedroom. <laughs> I'll just clear the tea things away. Whereabouts is the bedroom? Uh, left, straight ahead. Right. Oh! <laughs> Tiger skin rugs, get out of it. Oh! Oh! Coarse, awful man, you hurt me. Who's that? Goes for weeks. Comes to a pity pass when a person cannot do away with herself in the privacy of her own home. I might just as well throw myself into some vulgar motor car. Yes, I think I will. <laughs> Go on, then. What happens next? Go on. <laughs> well, they always break down the most exciting part, don't they? I don't think these wirelesses have got much future myself. <laughs> Oh, that's what's the matter, of course. The valve's gone. <laughs> right. Just open up the water over here. <laughs> oh, the carpet's in there, it's taking a journey, won't it? I'm ready. Right, sharp your tick. <laughs> right, go on and get on the end of this. Follow me, you go first. Oh. <laughs> Next cop. Is there a dog in here? Yeah. Not many people see that on first acquaintance. <laughs> How long have you had your own removals business? Oh, ever since I gave up my other profession and bought a van about 23 years now. Oh, what was your other profession? Demolitions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the name of the firm? Do you get a move on? Mate? Yes. Well, it's different. Yeah. It's named after what my mum used to say to me dad. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> Well, my second name is Sale, you see, S-A-L-E, and with Clarence the first name, on the side of that, it looked like Clearance Sale, you see. <laughs> I mean, every time I pulled up and started to unload, people wanted to buy everything. <laughs> yeah. Matter of fact, I, uh, I nearly went in for that for a while, you know, totting, you know, buying and selling. It's a great cockney tradition, that, buying and selling. Was your family ever in trade, was he? Some of my ancestors were gypsies. Go on, were they? Well, a long way back. Yeah. And I've got Irish blood in me as well. Have you? <laughs> well, well, the old gypos, eh? <laughs> I, I should take you on as a partner in a firm, shouldn't I? How do you mean? Well, gypsies, very apt, isn't it, for a removals firm? I mean, they like to keep moving, don't they? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're quite 
quite humorous, aren't you? You're a bit of a laugh yourself. <laughs> of course, that's the Irish in you, you see. I mean, the Irish like to laugh at themselves, don't they? Eh? Well, I suppose they think everyone else is laughing at them, they might as well join. <laughs> My uncle Dick, he was Irish. He used to mend kettles at the side of the road. Did he? <laughs> huh. I bet he was a little tinker. <laughs> Well, come on, this won't get the baby washed. Go and get your coat, we'll go up and see them bonfires, shall we? Oh, I can't wait. Right. I'll wait for you a minute. Uh, Don't go away. Hello, hello. <laughs> Blimey, that was quick. That's another thing I like about you, my girl. What? Listen, I've been thinking about you. You're a good sort, ain't you? And you've been crossed in love, ain't you? What? Now, hang on a minute, hang on. I mean, normally I don't go for women, as you know, but you're different. I mean, you're straight as a die, you carry your own weight, you don't yak, yak, yak all the time. In short, what about it, eh? What, what? about it? Us, you and me, getting spliced. Oh! 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 <laughs> That, I take it, is in the nature of a refusal. <laughs> well, in that case, I shall just take my leave of you, you daft-looking rotten female. <laughs> What's the matter with his bleeding lips? <laughs> has had the affront to it to ask me to marry him. He what? He said I was the girl for him. If he hadn't packed our telephone, I should certainly ring his employers. He asked you to marry him, miss. Very idea. I should have thought you would have been more his mark. If mother comes back to her, I've gone out to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> he asked her. He made me. He made me. <laughs> Where's all the furniture gone? I don't think it's that the world is on fire. Down warm, ain't it? <laughs> Radio England UK 2. Uh, I'm sorry, we're all full up at A&E. We're going to have to send you to B&Q. <laughs> Radio England UK 2. UK 2. Well, I said, you know, Mick, I sold my boy to Seamus, but if I had known he wasn't going to pay me, I would have charged him twice as much. Radio England UK 2. And how are you getting on with the reorganisation of the medical stores? Fine, sir. Once I decided to miss breakfast, that gave me a good four-hour run at it. I'm very impressed, Cor. Liar. I beg your pardon. <laughs> I'm a liar, sir. On the one hand, I'm telling you I've been hard at it for four hours, and on, on the other, there in my hand, for all the world to see, is a mug of tea, which makes it obvious that I skived off for five minutes to run to the naffy. Did you say you missed breakfast? Look, sir, when I say I'm going to do something for my commanding officer, that means I'm going to do it. It's like my missing supper last night. I mean, that shouldn't even come into the conversation. <laughs> now, see here, Corporal. You must try and remember that you're back on duty after your convalescence. There's no need for you to knock yourself up. Oh, it's simple cause and defect with me, sir. You mentioned that you needed the medical stores reorganising, and I am reorganising. Organising them, sir. But I didn't expect you to do it on your own, man. Good Lord, this hospital is crawling with bone idle national servicemen. Get some of them to help you. Is that an order, sir? No. A suggestion. Good, because I would never disobey an order. But I am going to take my life in my hands, sir, and disobey your suggestion. But why? Because I am old Air Force like yourself, sir. And when an old Air Force NCO says he's going to do a thing for his commanding officer, that means he himself is going to do it. God, those were the days. And these peacetime national servicemen, they weren't there. Uh, scramble, scramble, chops away. Hit the hand before he crosses the coast. But they weren't there, sir. Ankles up, son. 
Johnny's copped it, but what the hell, we'll have a beer and a sing-song. <laughs> but they weren't there. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when. <laughs> they weren't there, sir. Mind you, I'm not saying I was there. Oh, I'm not saying I was there either, sir, because I joined in 1946. <laughs> My legs were too short to be a pilot, that's why I wasn't there. Look, sir, if anyone throws your short legs in your face, they'll have me to deal with. <laughs> the point is, we know what the old Air Force meant, and it didn't mean enlist enlisting the help of national servicemen who don't care a damn whether the medical stores are reorganised or not. I'd sooner do it alone, sir. A key word, Marsh? Yale, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no. Alone, that's the key word. We were alone in 1940. Ah, oh, and I am alone this morning, sir, and that's the way I like it. Good man, carry on. I will, sir. Alone, sir. Come on, move yourselves! I said move yourselves! You should have had this lot reorganised by now. Come on, you should be finished by now. I said you should be finished by now! Bone idol! That's what you lot are, bone idol. <laughs> Whoa. Get your nose out of it, you dirty-minded little nose ache. Well, you're looking at it. Yeah, but not in the same way you was looking at it. Not in a dirty way. She was just a naked tart to you, wasn't she? Well, what was she at you then? I hardly noticed. I was reading the article. <laughs> what do you want, anyway? Yeah, says on this box, one gross of ampules. Only some's been taken out. Of course something's been taken out. It's hospital, isn't it? They use them, don't they? Well, what should I put on the label, then? How many's left in the box? Oh, you don't mean to say I've got to count every single one, do you? Oh, use your loaf. You know how many's been used. It's in the book. You take that number away from a gross, which is 142, and there's your answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, see. and that's without a slide rule, Sonny. <laughs> well, we'll be finished now, then, Corporal. I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, it's very nice, that. Yeah, very nice indeed. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, I've done a good job there. <laughs> right, pull back down whatever holes you came out of. Dismiss! Um, Smith, Lecky. Yes, Corporal? You're on the duty, aren't you? Yeah, well, you should know. You put us there. Like it, do you? Horrible. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> oh, pull the other one, Kilt Nasty. Do you think I don't know a four-tier flanker when I hear one? I just said I liked it in the morgue, Corporal. Ah, oh, I know that's what you said. You're just trying to make me think you like it. You said you like it because you ate it. And knowing that you ate it when you say you like it makes me like it when you say you like it because then I know you ate it. Work that one out. I don't know what you're talking about, Corporal. It means I've got you two, plus Puff House and Holy Joe Lily, all doing a job that you ate, which makes me very happy. <laughs> now push off before you curdle my tea. I really do like it in the morgue, Corporal. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. I do. He can't. <laughs> Can he? <laughs> well, go on then. Uh, no, you go. Oh, I don't mind going, Matthew. Just thought you might like to. No, thank you. Oh. Right. Well, I'll go then. Yes. Excuse me. We're from the morgue. <laughs> We've been sent up to collect the amputated hand. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, here it is then. Yes. There you are. Ah, come on, quick the lift. Hey, come on, lads. Open the theatre doors for me. All oh, right. <laughs> Oh, I went to old Slasher's demob play last night. Look, your old Slasher is well out of it. Oh, no, he's not. I thought you said it was his demob party. Oh, yeah, well, it was. Only he got drunk and found the snow drop. <laughs> he's got another 90 days to do now. <laughs> What's that? It's a box, Timothy. <laughs> I know it's a box, but what's it doing there? Why don't you ask it? Oh, very <laughs> good. Well, it's those 50 rubber catheters. That's stores, isn't it? <laughs> it's not laundry. Well, I'll put it on another way past later. <coughs> oh, God, it's gone. It can't have gone. Well, where is it then? It's gone. That's what I said. It's gone. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's gone? We've lost a hand. What are you talking about? You've got two each. 
It's an amputated hand from the theatre. We put it in the lift upstairs and then the lift went without us and we've dashed downstairs and now it's gone. Well, that's ridiculous. A hand don't just get up and walk away, does it? Well, where is it then? Well, it's gone, isn't it? <laughs> look, we'll split up and look for it. Come on, Matthew. Wish we had my spaniel Willie with us. He'd soon find it. <laughs> well, you haven't, have you? So we've got to. Yeah, but there's no time. We were told to report straight back to incinerate it. Well, you've had it then. Hey, you'll be punished for that. You'll be horribly punished for that. <laughs> look, hang up there, hang up there. Look, there's a fiddle for everything, right? All we've got to do is produce an hand. Now, any hand will do. Right, where do we get hand from? He's <laughs> just a bowl of chippy. <laughs> Oh, lads. Did you collect that amputation all right, Richardson? Uh, yes, Sergeant. It's in the box. Good. Let's have a look. <laughs> well done. I just entered that in the ledger. <laughs> right. Now then. Incineration. Hey, can I do that for you, Sergeant? I've said it before and I'll say it again, Bruce. You are what we in the trade call an MN, a mortuary natural. Of course you can do the incineration, son. You go ahead, enjoy yourself. <laughs> rare quality, rare quality. Well, I'll see you later, lads. I've just got to pop up to Ward F. There's an airframe fitter up there, but he won't last the night out. So I'll see if I can interest him in my new method of embalming. <laughs> Keep smiling. Good luck, Sergeant. <laughs> oh. Oh, neatly done, Bruce. Well, you've got to stick together. I just hope I haven't betrayed the trust they puts in me. And neatly done, Fritz Chrysler. Uh, who? You, the master fiddler. <laughs> I almost believed it was somebody else's hand myself. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, sir. Medical stores reorganised and ready for your inspection. Hmm. I hope you'll find everything Bristol-shaped and aeroplane fashion, sir. <laughs> Yes, my goodness me. So I can sense your presence here, Corporal. That is because I'm standing beside you, sir. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I mean, look at it. Place for everything. Everything in its place. <coughs> yes, that's you, Corporal. To hear such an utterance makes missing a few meals unimportant, sir. Good Lord. You've even polished the ends of the stethoscope. A fighter pilot keeps his guns clean, sir. Surely this isn't so different. You're quite right, of course. Would you also care to note, sir, that I have alphabeticalized all surgical instruments and horizontalized all bandages in sizes? <laughs> First class job, Corporal. Oh, thank you, sir. First class. But I still don't think you should have tackled it on your own. I thought we'd had that one out, sir. I want to be totally responsible for the fact that you, as a surgeon, a most brilliant surgeon, if I may say so, sir, may come down here at any time, open any box and find... <laughs> ah! <laughs> You made a tiny mistake there, didn't you, Corporal? But what do you mean, sir? That is a box of catheters. Oh. You had it on the spatula shop. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, Corporal. Now, even you're allowed one mistake. Give it to me, I'll put it away. No, no, it's a personal box, sir. I see. What's in there? Uh, uh, sandwiches, sir. Uh, hand, ham sandwiches. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I, I brought them in here, sir, because of missing those odd meals I told you about. No need to look so guilty, man. Nobody would blame you for doing that. Oh, you are immensely kind, sir. <laughs> well, Corporal, I will say this. You've made yourself entirely responsible for everything in this store. So if there are any discrepancies, I shall know who to come to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but of course there won't be, not with your dedication. <laughs> hmm. I'm doing theatre. A pneumothorax, you know. Oh, one of those, sir. Yeah. <laughs> As well, I'm here, I'll take a new set of operating kit. Mask. Gun. Cap. Yes. Beautifully organised. Certainly know where to find things now. Very well done. Oh. Jolly good. Thank you, sir. Oh, Corporal, give me a hand, will you? Hand? <laughs> yes, a hand. <laughs> Would you open this door, please, Corporal? Oh, that kind of hand, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Certainly, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh. There's only one way to get out, and that's to get some in. Get some in! It's time for National Service.
Here, Matthew. Hmm? I wonder if you come and take a look at my thumb. It done half hurt. Certainly. Now, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, it, it seems to have come off. <laughs> <laughs> you are stupid. Fancy falling for the same trick twice. You know that severed flesh is one of my delicate areas. Funny. Haircuts with me. Do you know it seems ages since I had a decent DA? Room service. Oh, lovely. And, and, two bottles of Chateau Light Ale, 1955. Right. Uh, would you care to try it, sir? Oh, thank you, my good man. Yes. Yes, yeah, simply splendid, that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Cheeky, but with an insistent affre goo, I always say. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you burp. <laughs> Beer at lunch. We are living pretty high off the hoof. Perfectly <laughs> celebrating, Matthew. It's a great five-fingered con of the century. Oh, what's that? What's that? Only convincing Sergeant Foot that we incinerated hand that we never even had. Oh, I've been to that. <laughs> what a wheeze. There you are. A toast. <laughs> toast. The hand. May we never see it again. Here, here. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's decent beer. What's the matter? I'll tell you what's the matter. What's happened to the hand we lost? <laughs> I've forgotten about that. Beer yeah, we all had. I mean, what if it's been handed in? <laughs> <laughs> what, what if it's in beer's lost? I mean, things do get lost. Buttons, pencils. But a hand. Hands do not get lost. As if. Oh, no, it's got to turn up somewhere. Perhaps it already has. Maybe it's in the sausages. Oh, shit. <laughs> or someone else does, right? <clears throat> Come on, we'll yeah, chuck you in half there. I haven't finished my sausages oh, yet. Oh, how can you eat them after what you've just said? Well, they're after turning me into everything else. Why not a cannibal? <laughs> Any luck? No, you? No. It's such a bizarre thing to look for. I mean, you can't just go up to somebody and say, excuse me, but have you seen a hand lying about? <laughs> I know. I'd be dead casual when I made inquiries about whether there was any blocked drains. Oh. <laughs> I did think I'd found it once. Yeah? Yeah, it was just somebody's glove. <laughs> Here, you don't reckon Bruce could be right, do you? You don't think it found its way to the cookhouse? No. no even rat cooks wouldn't. <laughs> Mind you, L.A.C. Pierce did find a toe cap in his Irish studio the other day. <laughs> yeah? The toes weren't still in it, were they? No. No, that's just ridiculous. Oh. Wretched animals. I never did like Alsatians. My Spaniel Willie would never have done a thing like that. <laughs> Where have you been? In the guard dog compound. Why? Ask Mr. Clever Lecky. It was his idea. It was perfectly logical. If somebody had found a hand lying about, they could have said, I know, I'll give it to the guard dogs. <laughs> yes, but I was the poor ninny who had to go in there, wasn't I? They nearly ate me. Which proves my point. Guard dogs are partial to human meat. Will you shut up? Ask for yourself. Oh, stop eating out sausages, Bruce. Well, we've had it then, haven't we? Look, chaps, I'll take the blame. After all, it was me that put the hand in the, in the lift in the first place. Now, look, stick together. Blame shared, blame halved. There's four of us. Oh, quoted then. Yeah. Hung and drawn, I dare say. No, if only we hadn't... Of course. Uh, hello, mate. Yeah, what do you want? Oh, nothing. Nothing, no. I was just wondering, actually. He was just wondering, Timothy. Uh, do you two usually do the laundry, then? No. We're brain surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> of course we do. We've been doing it for nine months, day in, day out. Yeah, well, did you do it this morning at all? Yeah, of course we did. Oh. I don't suppose you happened to find a box at all in the lift, did you? Yeah. As a matter of fact, we did. You didn't, uh, open it, did you? We might have. <laughs> Listen, you little tease pots. You have picked the wrong time to tease, right? All right, mate, all right. He's only having a laugh. Yeah, well, stop laughing, eh? And tell me what you did with the box. Well, it had a medical label on it, so we stuck it in medical stores. I do think the big cheese has come through for you again, Matthew. Hello, lads. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you care to step into the mortuary with me. There's just a little discrepancy I'd like to clear up. I think the cheese has just gone mouldy. <laughs> Oh, Hello, lads. Have a nice lunch. Well, don't get down to it. Squeegees out. Before you send them off, Sars, there is a little matter of mortuary procedure I would like to discuss with you. Oh, who might you be, Corporal? Corporal Mars, GM. Oh, yes, I've heard about you. I didn't come down here for praise, Sergeant. <laughs> You're not going to get any. What do you want? I want the breakdown on mortuary procedure regarding an amputated hand as laid down in station standard orders. Oh, you do, do you? I am, of course, fully backed up in this matter by the commanding officer, no, look, whose you... best friend's life I tried to save when winning this medal. 
All right, what do you want to know? I understand a hand was amputated only this morning. Yes? Well, then, would you care to tell me why the aforesaid hand did not arrive in the mortuary? It did. Eh? Yes, that's it all down in my ledger. Look. <laughs> oh, that's only right, and that is. That's normally what you do in a ledger. Yeah, but I bet, you, <laughs> you, I bet you never actually saw it. Of course I did. What, saw it with your eyes? That's generally what you do with your eyes. <laughs> and it was incinerated, was it? Yes. Can you prove that? Of course I can. It's done in the ledger. Look, incinerated. 10.05 hours. Oh, don't fall back on writing. Shakespeare done that. And look what happened to him. They chopped his ear off. <laughs> I am referring to visual verification as laid down in station standing orders, paragraph 17, subsection E. The NCOIC mall must underline, personally underlined, supervise underlined the incineration of any amputation. Did you personally supervise the incineration? Well, I... Uh... Of course he did, Corporal. Sergeant Foote does everything by the book. Yes, quite right. Of course, I supervise it personally. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, Sergeant, I do seem to remember that you asked me to open the incinerator door so you could put the hand in personally. Correct, Smith. Ah. Uh -huh. Good lad. Uh, how many hands have there been? Only one in the last three years. Which you yourself incinerated in front of four witnesses. Anyway, why are you so obsessed with this particular incineration? Oh, I'm not incinerating anything about this insinuation. <laughs> I was just trying to make sure that all hands were accounted for. Well, of course they are. You don't get odd hands floating about. No, of course you don't. Of course you don't. Very true. Oh, well, I'll be off then. What have you got in the box, Corporal? The sandwiches. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sarge, that's why I popped down here. Not to stir up any trouble or anything. That's not in my nature. It's just that my sandwiches are cold up and gone dry and I was wondering if I could pop them into your incinerator. Oh, no. Station standing orders expressly forbid, underlined, the use of the incinerator for any other purposes than medical. Yeah, all right. Well, I'll just chuck it, uh, the sandwiches in a dustbin somewhere else. Could I do that for you, Corporal? No, man, sandwiches are a personal thing. <laughs> and when a man's sandwiches curl up and go dry, I think it is down to the man personally to throw them in the dustbin. It's in. very interesting, you know, these days. Refuse collecting. Oh, yeah? What'd you say that, Inkin? Well, these days, they're so thorough. They sort through it all with a fine tooth comb, you know. They put paper in one pile, meth in another, edibles for pigs in another, any unusual <laughs> objects in another. Rubbish, that's rubbish, and rubbish should just be rubbish. First of all, you're obsessed with the hands, now you're obsessed with throwing your sandwiches away. Oh, I'm not nutty, I've just got a tidy mind. <laughs> I was just trying to make sure that there was no chance of any hands slipping through the net. Of course, that's what happened in The Beast with Five Fingers. What's that? This film about a hand. It kept trying to strangle anyone who got in its way. Stupid idea. Yes, that's right. It it kept sort of crawling about of its own accord, like a kind of five-legged spider. <laughs> yeah, it tell you the bit I liked, when I nailed the end at a table, only it tore itself free and come after him. But, <laughs> mate, of course, if you believe in something like the curse of Tutankhamen... Tutankhamen? You know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the mummy's hand, and the mummy was after the bloke that had the hand. Plus the hand itself. You're all ghouls. <laughs> Working down here has turned you all into ghouls. Ghouls! <laughs> Is now opened a branch near the cemetery in Dublin because they said if you can't take it with you, this is a chance to be near it. <laughs> Radio England UK 2. We present Frankie Howard. <laughs> with June Whitfield and Bob Todd. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is, of course, 
Francis Howard. Not an impressionist. This is your actual Francis Howard himself. No, you're... Oh, God. Oh, these trousers are tight. Nothing worse. Anyway, um, look, the thing was this. You're saying to yourselves, what is Francis? Look, there's a woman here dozing off already. Mrs. Don't go off now. We yeah, just started with all this to get through yet, poor soul. <laughs> she had a long journey, I suppose. Um, no, you see, the thing was this. I, you say to yourself, what is Francis doing on steam radio? You see, I'll tell you, I got this call from the head of the radio, the uh, man who runs this place. What's the man's name? Uh, <laughs> thing, you know, thing. And, uh, no, not big thing, dear, that's the... That's the head of television. This is radio's small thing. Anyway, I had this call from Small Thing. Yes, what's his name, Small Thing? And he said, well, I do a series for the radio. And he was very nice about it, ever so nice. He said, if I didn't come round right away, he'd report me to the post office for not having a license. Oh, it was so nice, so sweet, charming. I went to, to the entrance, here, he said, to the entrance. And I saw this notice up. Bingo. Bingo, I thought to myself, I must have made a mistake. So this chap in the front, this, you know, the doorman, he said, no, it's all right. He said, no, this is the BBC. It's the BBC. He said, the only thing is that we have to fulfil two functions now because we're so poverty struck. <laughs> so because he, he said, it's the British Bingo Corporation during the afternoon and the British Broadcasting Corporation night, you see, because we're trying to make some money for steam radio. So anyway, I paid my 20 pence and I went in. <laughs> and... Now, come along, come along, some good stuff here going to waste. No, no, no charity. And there was another man in, inside, and every time I gave him my ticket, he tore it in half. I had to buy tickets. And so I went up in the lift, and it was another mistake, because that was 25 pence. But I had to get out, another 20 pence, and that's not including the tip. And I wouldn't have minded that, but it took me, it cost me 50 pence. 50 pence to, to get into this uh, small thing's office. 50 pence. 10 pence for the deck chair. <laughs> what a liberty. What a liberty. I mean, small thing, wasn't there? No, I just I had to talk to his assistant. Very small thing. <laughs> anyway, I was in this office and this assistant, this assistant, he drew himself up to his full height and he said, come on, Howard. He said, don't waste, never say Howard, it's all hard. Come on, Howard, he said, don't waste my time. He said, I'm a busy man. I'm writing my memoirs. So, uh, yes, I said, are you? Oh, well, I finished mine, just finished mine. Oh, yes, I've written my memoirs, 18 volumes, four of those of the index. I told him, I said, look, you're not the only one who's mixed with the upper crust. I've had several fingers in the pie with the upper crust. <laughs> what? There's everything in my memoirs, you know, war, sex, politics, sex, <laughs> show business, sex. <laughs> My memoirs are so hot you could toast bread in between the pages. <laughs> toast bread in between the pages! <laughs> oh, you fools! <laughs> then, of course, I said this about my memoirs, and of course, this uh, assistant, what's his name? Very small thing. His whole attitude changed. His eyes shone like the back of an MP's trousers <laughs> on the last day of a party conference. <laughs> He asked for my autograph. Autograph, because I signed. Just said I signed. And that was Francis's downfall. Flattery. I'd signed a radio contract for the serialization of my memoirs. A hundred pounds a show. But it's ridiculous. I mean, I can't afford to pay the BBC a hundred pounds a show. <laughs> You see, I was in, I, I was, I, I'm, see, the thing was this, I was in a real tiz was, because I hadn't really written my memoirs. I mean, I was only got a madam that for the, this, what's the day, very small thing. I mean, I hadn't written any memoirs. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do? So I thought, ah, it was obvious what I needed, a woman to take them down. <laughs> and, uh, she's woke up now again, madam. Take the words down, dear. Take the words down for the memoirs. You've got a right one over there, I tell you. So anyway, I advertised for a woman. Shorthand type is required to type memoirs for distinguished literary figure. Please bring own typewriter. Well, I got hundreds of replies, all from this one woman. <laughs> Now, you are Miss Lyme. Won't you sit down, dear? Not on me, dear. Not on me. That's better. Mm. Oh, and you didn't even know I was ill. I'm much better, thank you, yes. Yes. <laughs> a funny woman, isn't she? 
<laughs> now, perhaps we should start by discussing the fee. Do lumps. Yes. <laughs> How old are you, Miss Lyme? How old? Oh, four o'clock. Really? You don't look a day over ten past three. <laughs> Um, I think we'll give you a little test. No, no, I, I don't wear a vest. A, a test, dear, test. Uh, no need to shout, I'm not deaf. Oh, I'm sorry. Not at all. Oh, I haven't got my machine switched on. Yes. Oh, all right. Have you ever typed anyone's memoirs before? No, no, but I have worked in a Scotch wool shop. <laughs> well, I wasn't actually intending to knit my memoirs. <laughs> I worked in a laundry. Oh, that'll come in useful. Some of the chappers will need cleaning up. Right. Now, let's go on with the test. Right. Now. Fire away. Pardon? Fire away. Fire away. Right. <clears throat> Francis Howard's Memoirs by Francis Howard. Chapter one. It was a typical January evening when I was born. The wind was howling. The rain was falling heavily. The trees arched their backs against the storm. It was almost as if the weaker ones were cowering against their larger brethren for shelter. In fact, it was real brass monkey weather. <laughs> Can you read that back, please? Oh, I didn't get all of it. Well, read what you got. It was. <laughs> well done. It was well done. Oh, God. <laughs> Forget the shorthand. Put it straight on the typewriter. Put on the typewriter, Put all right? Put it on the... That's right. Oh, typewriter. Oh, yes. I'll go a little bit slower, and you go a little bit faster, and we'll try and meet in the middle, as the Archbishop said to the actress. <laughs> Mr. Howard. I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, now, you ready? Yes. Fire away. Now, when I was 14... Yes, fire away. Oh, God. I just... <laughs> when I was 14, we moved to number five, Forest Road, Fulham. One day, when I was in bed with flu, my father said to me, Frankie, I want to tell you the facts of sex. Well, I was flabbergasted. Francis's flabber has never been so ghasted. <laughs> at that moment, at that moment, at that moment, my father's trousers suddenly fell to the floor. It was a complete farce. Right. <laughs> Read that back. <laughs> but my trousers are gone then. Go on. <laughs> when I was 14, we moved to number I's Orist Road, Ulham. Orist Road, Ulham? <laughs> yes, well, I, I, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you there are no Fs on my typewriter. No Fs? Flipping egg. Let's have a look at that now. Let's have a look. We, we can't print. We can't print this. When I was 14, we moved to number five of this road, Ulam. One day, when I was in bed with Lou, John, <laughs> my father said to me, Ranky, I want to tell you the acts of sex. Well, I was lubbergasted. Rouses' lubber has never been so ghasted. At that moment, my father's trousers suddenly held to the lure. It was a complete arse. <laughs> she was pretty good, wasn't she? Very good. I mean, I didn't mind her without her Fs. Uh, so long as she didn't drop her Hs. I minded her Ps and Qs. I mean, all I had to do was to go to the stationery office and say, I want an F. Except I didn't have enough LSD, so I had to give an IOU. But really, it was all as simple as ABC. Isn't this cleverly written, all this? <laughs> Down the floor for the writers. Down the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I was ready now to start making notes for my memoirs, but I didn't have a pen, a pen. And my memoirs, I thought, deserved better than a pen. Because all the best of we scribblers, you know, Shakespeare, all that mob... They used quills. Quills. So I went out to get a cheap quill. <laughs> quill misses it. She is again. She's as common as muck, this one down here. <laughs> now, now, the thing was, I went to the shopkeeper, and he said, we don't do them anymore, they don't do them anymore. The only thing you can do is to get a swan. So I got a swan. <laughs> What a fool! What a blind fool! You should not take other people's advice. 
I couldn't get the beak into the inkwell. <laughs> and when I did it, wrote in this large, sprawling letters everywhere, you see. So I thought, now, before I put Swan to paper, <laughs> I'd ring the producer and find out the form, find out the form. Now, this producer said, X, Y, V, stroke, in triplicate, by Friday, because they're form mad, you know, here. Oh, form mad. This producer, he's ex-Navy, you know. Ex-Navy. Well, you can tell these military types, they give themselves away, apart from his walk and the gold braid on his sleeve. He goes around saying, hello, sailor. Well, I mean... <laughs> So I said to this producer, David, I said, it's my pleasure to work with you. Where shall I start my memoirs? He said, now tell them all about your distinguished military career you were mentioning to me. Well, nothing wrong with the pioneer corps, is there? <laughs> my first day in the army, they said, now what are your qualifications? I told them, a degree in high mathematics. I speak 18 languages. I'm an expert marksman. So they pushed me in the stores. Typical, isn't it? Isn't that typical? <laughs> in the stores. And the first in these stores, the first thing I noticed, there was no clothes. No clothes, I think. I said to myself, this, this is a nude army. Look, you can't have a nude army marching on its stomach. But it ruins their Saturday nights. <laughs> and their Sunday mornings. Anyway, then I discovered the truth. My sergeant was on the fiddle. No, on the fiddle. He dyed all the uniforms blue and then flogged them to the Air Force. This was during the war. A, oh, a real fiddler. Well, later that afternoon, you see, I was in the stores. A thousand new arrivals were due. A thousand. We had no kit. And the sergeant said to me, about time you did a bit of fiddling, he said, go down to the greengrocers and get all the kit. I said, the greengrocers? He said, yes. We get all our clothes from the greengrocers on the black market, black market. He said, oh, by the way, while, while you're down there, get me some white fronts on the side. <laughs> well, it takes all sorts to make a world, doesn't it? There, yeah, there I was on my way down to the greengrocer to get some black market uniforms for these new arrivals on. It was so degrading. Ah, oh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. I'd like a thousand pair of boots, please. Oh, uh, we don't sell boots, sir. We sell Brussels sprouts. Don't be silly. How can we expect a thousand men of the Pioneer Corps to march about on parade wearing Brussels sprouts on their feet when they would get corns on the cobs? That was silly. Now, you now, listen to me, sir. I'm listening. This is a greengrocer's, not the Army and Navy stores. Look, I understood. You know. Hush, hush. Under the counter. Black market. Black market? <laughs> Who told you that? Harry in the chip shop. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? <laughs> How many boots do you require? A thousand left boots and 999 right boots. <laughs> you see, one of the men has a wooden leg. You understand? <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Uh, will there be anything else? Yes, I want a thousand ties. No, no, 999 ties and a dog collar for the padre. <laughs> Well, sir, the only dog collar I can get is off my own dog. Oh. And there's only one snag. Oh. It has Fido written on it. Oh, no. <laughs> they won't do. The padre's name is Rover. Oh. <laughs> oh, what a pity. Yeah. Uh, that is the lot, is it? Well, no, there's one other little thing, one little thing. While I'm here, I might as well have a couple of green peppers. Oh, dear, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I am right out of green peppers. Right out of green peppers? There's a lot of demand. Oh, this is outrageous. Oh, I'm very sorry. In that case, you can forget the whole order. How dare you, good morning. Now, now come to the part you've all been waiting for. Francis Howard reveals all about his love life. <laughs> hello, hello. His love life, work. Oh, I love work. Ah, you see. Oh, I love work. My first job, actually, was for a tie manufacturer. But after a while, I told him to get knotted. <laughs> then I went to Sheffield to make knives, but I couldn't stand the grind. Um, I was a clairvoyant, too. I was such a bad clairvoyant, I saw no future in it. <laughs> They're coming out thick and fast now, aren't they? They're rattling out. Oh, we, you laugh. We used to work hard in those days. Eight hours a day, and I was just walking to work. <laughs> Actually, one of the hardest jobs I had was in the fire brigade. And it was the danger. It's the danger. I'll tell you about one of the most dangerous 999 calls I ever had. <laughs> Shush! 
Amen. Good morning, madam. Oh, thank God you've arrived. Where's the fire? Fire? There's no fire. No fire? Do you realise, madam, that outside I have three fire engines, two tenders and a salvage wagon? You only have the fire service in an emergency. This is an emergency. Oh, what is it? I want a man. <laughs> well, you've got 20 of them now. I only want one. You send the other 19 back. We can't allow this sort of behaviour, madam. I'm afraid I'll have to report you. Now, please, what is your name? Partridge. Miss Partridge. Give me a kiss. Please, put me down, Mrs. <laughs> please. Keep your hands to yourself, oh. Miss Partridge. Stop tickling my ear. I haven't finished my report. Now, I must take down your particulars. Oh, yes. Miss Partridge! <laughs> now, leave my collar and tie alone. They're government property. Now, now, stop unbuttoning my tunic. It's government property. That's not government property. <laughs> my helmet. Let me have my helmet back. Come on, lover boy. I'm all yours. Do not pinch my bottom, Miss Partridge. <laughs> Miss Pat, don't pinch. Madam, do not. Oh, madam, do. I mean, not. Help. Police! Police, where's the phone? Oh, come here, darling. You're all mine. Find us, keep oh, us. Get off, get off. Here's the phone. Hello, 999. Hello, 999. Get me the police. This is an emergency. Give us a kiss. Put me down, Miss Partridge. No, you're mine. Oh, you're mine. I'm not. Yes, you are. There's a waiting list. Get back, Miss Partridge, please. Please contain yourself. Oh, thank God. The police have arrived in the nick of time. Oh, dear. It's not the police. It's Policewoman Grace. Hello, hello. It's Frankie comes. Come on. Give us a kiss, oh, Frankie. No, I can't. I'm too weak. I can't. I'm too weak. No more. Now, you're, you're, it's all very well. It's all very well, you're saying. I can hear you asking, what about your show business career? What about your show business career? That's what you're asking, isn't it? Well, you've got to get it. You've got to get it. <laughs> no, I tell you, it's not easy being a comic, actually. For instance, you go to a party. Now, you go to a party. They expect you to be funny all the time. It's too much. You can't do it all the time. I mean, if, if you invite a bricklayer round for tea, you don't expect him to build a brick wall in your front room, do you? If a North Sea gas driller pops round, you don't expect him to be boring all the time, do you? I mean, ask a taxidermist round. Taxidermist round. I mean, well, you don't expect him to stuff the... Oh, I don't know, though. You might, dear. She might. I, you know, I, can, I tell you something, because the parties, you know, cabarets, I remember one party, I just done the cabaret, it didn't pay me, of course. No, no, they paid me, they didn't pay me, they, they just said, stay and enjoy the party, you see. And, of course, the sort of people at these parties, you know, the terrible sort of, always off for golf, off for golf, you see. And they said to me, do you play golf? I said, yes. They said, what do you play off? I said, grass. <laughs> That's true. You'd think they'd know, wouldn't you? Well, anyway, I was at this party, and I was getting a bit out of my depth, I thought, well, how to do something. So I thought I'd tell them a story, something, you know, a bit, you know, risky, saucy, filthy. <laughs> All they like it as much as we do, yes. Well, it, it can sometimes be a bit awkward even telling a funny story. <laughs> Lord Colchester, one moment. I must tell you this story. I couldn't tell it in the act. Uh, jolly good, yes. Well, you see, there was this woman of ill repute, you see, and she lived in this ramshackle little house in the red light district of Bishop Stortford. <laughs> now, one day, this one-legged dwarf came round. <laughs> yes, very yes. <laughs> yeah, good, very yeah, good story. Yes. <laughs> I haven't finished yet. Oh, sorry, carry on. Yeah. Well, this dwarf came round, you see, and this woman, she had these two enormous, I mean, really huge... Hello. Oh, hello, Major. Mr. Howard was just telling me a story about this woman of ill repute who came round, and she had these two absolutely enormous, gigantic... Um, yes, uh, yes, she, she, as I was saying, she had these two absolutely enormous, these huge... 
Yes. Tulips. Tulips, yes. Tulips. That's right, tulips. And this dwarf, you see, he'd never seen a woman with such big tulips, so he said, can I kiss you on your tulips? In Bishop Stortford? Yes. <laughs> yes, you see, the Bishop of Stortford, he sent for these two naughty vicars. Hello, can I come in? Oh, yeah, hello, vicar, yes. <laughs> Uh, the vicar, I say this one is right up your street, whatever. <laughs> Mr. Howard's telling us an awfully good story about the Bishop of Stortford and how he sent for a pair of naughty vicars. Oh, yes. Dear, dear, dear. Carry on, Mr. Howard. Well, uh, the Bishop sent for this pair of naughty uh, knickers. You said vicars. Ah, well, yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, well, ah, I, I meant knickers. I don't like jokes about knickers. Knickers, no. Well, I, well, he sent for these naughty knickers and he said to them, You've been nicking things. Things you naughty knickers. You see? They took the collection. Took it right away, you see? They were from Twickers. They were from Twickers. Knickers from Twickers. <laughs> nasty rubber types. What's wrong with Wagger? The nasty rubber tykes. Yeah. They were nasty tykes. Yorkshiremen, you see. Horrible Yorkshiremen. Did I hear something about horrible Yorkshiremen? Yes. Uh, well, horrible Yorkshiremen are rare because there aren't many of them, you see. They're so sweet. And this woman, you see, she was in the club. Athenium. Pudding. And... Uh, <laughs> the the pudding club? Yes, the Yorkshire Pudding Club, you see. Uh, she was uh, anti-Yorkshire Pudding. She was in the Society for the Prevention of Yorkshire Pudding. Eh? Uh, yes, yes. Is that the end of the story? Uh, well, uh, no. I'll start again. Look, so many interruptions. Now, there was this woman from Bishop Stortford who had these two enormous tulips... And this chap touched her tulips. Which chap? Uh, the, uh, 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 the, the German. A German, did you say? Well, a g uh, germ, 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 the germane tulip. You see, the, the main, you see, it's a pun, the germane. <laughs> um, was touched, this main tulip was touched by this man from Pakistan. From Pakistan? I am from Pakistan. Yes, well, <laughs> in this park in Stan, Istan, in Istanbul, and these tubers were touched in a park in Istanbul. Oh, well, how did I hear you say a park in Istanbul? That's right. That reminds me of the story about Dwarf and the girl with the enormous boobs. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of my first chapter of my memoirs. Next week I shall be telling you more about my glamorous life. How I won the war, single-handed. <laughs> How I climbed Everest with an international party of nymphomaniacs. <laughs> How I swam the channel both ways, twice, non-stop. And, of course, how I got my first parking ticket in Nuneaton. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. God bless. And the best of luck. Thank you. Radio England, UK 2. We present Jimmy Clitheroe as the Clitheroe Kid with Peter Sinclair, Patricia Burke, Danny Ross, Derek Garner and Diana Day in... Accidents will happen. <laughs> What's the time, Susan? 25 to 2, Mother. 25 to 2, and your grandfather and Jimmy not in for their lunch yet. Well, they didn't have breakfast till 10 o'clock. Maybe they're not hungry yet. Oh, Jimmy's always hungry. The boy with the bottomless stomach. <laughs> I bet he's the only lad in this town who takes sandwiches to the pictures. <laughs> Where did they go? To the barber's for their annual haircut. But they can't have been there all this time. Oh, you never know. The barber might still be sweeping up from the last time they went. <laughs> Anyway, I can't wait for them. I've got to be at the hairdressers myself at two o'clock. Oh, yes. And this time, why didn't you have a different hairstyle? Never again. The last time the man taught me at having a, a pony's tail. And when I walked in here, Jimmy started singing. The old grey mare, she ain't what she used to be. <laughs> oh, you don't want to take any notice of him. Have a look in these magazines. There should be plenty of styles to pick from. Oh, good gracious, the magazine's there for Alfie. Oh, Alfie? Oh, what does he want with women's magazines? But not for him. He's meeting his mother at the hospital with him. You know, she's in the WVS and she distributes them round the wards. Could you take them to his house for me, love? I said I'd let him have them by two o'clock. Oh, Mother, I'm in my old jeans. I'm not dressed to go out. Oh, well, slip round on Jimmy's bike. Nobody will notice. Hmm, I hope they don't want that dirty old wreck he's bought. Oh, all right. Is this all there are? Yes. Thank you, love. I suppose Jimmy's bike will be round the back. Won't be long, Mother. Oh, what's keeping those two? 
Oh, I'll have to get that home dinner. All right, Jimmy. Don't keep on about a barber. Well, it's the last time I go to him. He's not a barber. He's a, he's a sheep shearer. <laughs> now, what's the matter? Oh, he's annoyed just because the man cut his hair a wee bit short. A bit short? I asked for a Tony Curtis and he gave me a David Nixon. <laughs> Now, look, Jimmy, it's not as bad as all that. Go on, take a cup off, Jimmy, and show me. Why do you want to laugh? Come on, Jimmy, do as your mother says. Oh, never mind. I've got no time to waste. I've got to go to the hairdressers myself. Well, if you'll take my advice, as soon as you go in, hide these clippers. Pat, wait a minute. We haven't had our lunch yet. Well, you're late. You'll have to see to it yourself. I'm off out. And Susan's gone to Alfie Hall's on Jimmy's bicycle. You what? That's nice. No hair, no lunch, no bike. <laughs> You'll get your lunch. But I thought you said it wasn't ready. It's in the kitchen. It just needs warming up. Surely you can do that. Look, I'm not complaining. It won't be the first time I've had to cook a meal. Why, oh, when I was in the merchant navy, I once cooked for the whole ship's company. I'll bet that's what caused the mutiny on the bounty. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to eat my cooking if you don't want it. Oh, I've got no time to listen to you two arguing. I'll be back in an hour. I was only kidding, Grandad. I don't mind your cooking. After all, it once got me a day off school. <laughs> oh, you're a storyteller. Come on, let's go into the kitchen and see what there is. Now then, what have we here? Oh, gosh. Oh, tell me the worst, Grandad. What is it? Jimmy, it is the worst. Cottage pie. Again? We had cottage pie yesterday and we left half of it. This is the half we left. <laughs> oh, heck. All right, but I'm warning you. That sauce bottle's going to get a bit of a bashing. It'll do, and for a sweet, I'll make you a tapioca pudding. Oh, Grandad, and I thought you were my best friend. Oh, listen, Jimmy. Tapioca pudding is very good for you. Why? When I was a lad, my mother often used to make it. No wonder you ran away to see when you were 13. <laughs> oh, come on, Grandad. Hurry up with the dinner. I keep getting funny noises in me tummy. All right, all right. The pie's in the oven. I'll just light the gas. Ah, there's no gas. Got a shilling, Jimmy. Have I got a shilling? A poor lad like me. The last time I looked at my piggy bank, all I found was fluff. <laughs> I, I suppose you spent all your money buying that broken-down old bike. Oh, it didn't cost much. I'm buying it from my pal Ozzy on the Never Never. What do you mean? Well, two bob down and a tanner every time Ozzy sees me first. <laughs> Mind you, it, it, it needs doing up a bit. As soon as I get me pocket money, I'm taking it to the shop to get something put on it. Well, what are you having put on it? Brakes. <laughs> The policeman outside our school said they weren't good enough. When did he tell you that? Just after I ran into him on point duty. <laughs> Jimmy, you mean Susan's gone to Alfie's on a bike with no brakes? How's she going to stop? Easy, do what I do, drag her foot along the ground. <laughs> hey, um, was she wearing toeless shoes when she went out? I don't know. She will be when she comes back. <laughs> if she ever comes back. Out of my way till I get to that telephone. I'm going to ring Alfie's and, and, and warn Susan not to ride that bike back home. If she comes to any harm, your mother go mad. Ah, oh, it's engaged. How do you know? Because of the noise. Beep, 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 beep. If you could play that on the guitar, it could be in the top ten. <laughs> Never mind the jokes. Now, this is serious. I'll have to try later. Trust Alfie to be on the phone at a time like this. Oh, yes, Vicar. Certainly, Vicar. Yeah, I'll wait for you to come round, Vicar. Yeah, thank you for ringing, Vicar. Goodbye, Vicar. Yeah, I'm sorry, Susan. That was the Vicar. <laughs> I would never have guessed. Yeah, he's bringing me some books to take to the hospital. He's fetching little women in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Well, they should go down well in the men's ward. Oh, no, no, I'm taking them to the... Oh, are you joking? <laughs> yeah, anyway, th thank you for bringing that magazine around from your mother. I think I deserve a medal. I came on Jimmy's old bike and found there were no brakes. The only way I could stop it was by dragging my foot along the ground. Well, you want to tell him about that? You might have hurt yourself. I mean, riding a bike without brakes, it isn't easy to stop. You've got to use your head. Not not to stop, to think. I mean, <laughs> come in. Uh, uh, excuse me, walking in, but... Can I use your phone? A woman's had an accident. Why well, didn't your brakes work? Brakes? She fell off a ladder next door. N next door? Hey, you mean Miss Chadwick? 
I, I don't know her name. There's nobody else in. I was just passing by. I think she'd broken her leg. Oh, eh? Oh? Hey, look, the, the, the phone's over there. Look, you, you better ring for an ambulance. I said, yeah, dial 27. No, I mean three nines. <laughs> oh, very much. Oh, well, I'd better go out and see what I can do. Give me that rug, Alfie. It's cold outside. Oh, why don't you wear your coat? It's not for me, for Miss Chadwick. If she's out there on her own, I'd better go to the hospital with her. Yeah, right on. As soon as the vicar's been, I'll come down to the hospital myself. Hey, I, I better phone your Jimmy and tell him to come round for his back as soon as that man's finished. Oh, I, I want an ambulance, please. Uh, a lady... <laughs> I'm doing my best. I've only one pair of hands. Well, I hope you've washed them. Everything you cook tastes a thick twist. <laughs> uh, it's a pity you don't have to go to school on Saturday. You could have had your dinner there. You what? You should have seen what we had yesterday. Pea soup, boiled cod and plum duff. Oh, what's wrong with that? What? Just before a singing lesson, after four helpings of plum duff... You can't breathe, never mind sing. Well, why did you have to have four helpings? Because I like it. No wonder you couldn't sing. What did the music mistress say? Who? Oblong Olive. <laughs> on my nerves. All the time she kept saying, James, are you not singing properly? Open your mouth wider. Wider. Wider still. <laughs> what did you do? I said, if it's wide enough for a gobstopper, it should be wide enough for nymphs and shepherds. <laughs> and then, what do you think happened? What? She gave me the cane. She was entitled to give you the cane. Yes, but she didn't have to hit me on the same spot as the history master. <laughs> so he gave you the cane as well? Yeah, just because I answered two questions wrong. Well, what questions were they? Well, for a start, who was the father of the Black Prince? What did you say? Oh, King Cole. <laughs> about the second one, he wrote down, name the legendary hero with the winged feet. Legendary hero with the winged feet? Hmm. Oh, yes, that's Mercury. Get away, it's Matthews. <laughs> oh, I don't envy him his job, teaching you history. Well, he's daft. What can you make of a fellow who knows hundreds of dates and can't remember your name? What do you mean? Well, he calls everybody in the class Ben. Ben? Yeah, Ben Dover. <laughs> Another of your jokes. I'm daft for listening to you. Here, go and answer the phone while I see how the pie's doing. Right, Grandad. All right, all right. Is that you, Jimmy? No, it's Big Chief Rumble, Tommy. <laughs> hey, I've got a message for our Susan. Will you tell her? I've got no dinner and the bike's got no brakes. Yeah, well, we know all about that. I'm phoning you up to tell you to come round and collect your bike. Why can't our Susan fetch it? Well, because she's not here. She's on her way to the General Hospital. Did you say ge ge General Hospital? Yeah, yeah, there's been an accident. Hey, just a minute, Vicar, I'm on the phone, Vicar. Yeah, Jimmy, the, the Vicar's at the door after ring off. But, but wait a minute, how can we get in touch with our Susan? Yeah, well, I should try the casualty ward, ta -da. Wait a minute, Alfie. Alfie! He's hung up the twit. Oh, heck. When me mum finds out about this... I'll be in the next bed to our Susan. Come on, Jimmy, help me set this table or we'll never get any dinner. Grandad, I don't want any. What are you talking about? Grandad, if I tell you something, you won't be cross, will you? Cross? What about? About what I'm going to tell you. Look, what have you got to tell me? Well, will you be cross? I don't know whether I'll be cross or not till you tell me what it is. Mm, I'll bet you will. Say what you've got to say before I lose my temper. Hey, are you cross and I haven't even told you yet? Jimmy, I promise I won't be cross. Now, what is it? Our Susan's had an accident on my bike with no brakes on and you're not cross because you promised. You what? A bother? How do you know? Alfie Hall just phoned. They've taken her to the general hospital. Poor Susan. I knew this would happen with that old bike of yours. Come on, we'll have to find out what's wrong. I can tell you that. No brakes, four broken spokes, and the valve rubber's perished. <laughs> I'm talking about Susan. Come on, we'd better go straight to the hospital. But, but, but we've had no dinner. Your dinner? What about poor Susan lying there in the hospital? We'll leave hers in the oven. <laughs> Don't be stupid, Jimmy. Get your coat while I write a note for your mother. 
Now, I wonder which is the quickest way to the hospital. I know that. How? Have a ride on my bike. <laughs> taxi before. He's smashing into it. Ah, uh, very enjoyable. It's, it's a long way to the hospital, isn't it? Aye, a very long way. Grandad, why do you keep staring at it like that? Staring at what? That little meter that keeps going up threatens the time. I'm just keeping my eye on the road. Oh, well, uh, are you looking for shortcuts? Jimmy, I'm in no mood for jokes. Did you bring all those things for Susan? Yeah, they're all here. Grapes, magazines, lemon squash. Bed jacket, alarm clock. What have you brought the alarm clock for? Well, you know what our Susan's like for getting up in the morning. <laughs> There'll be a nurse to waken her up. Well, who wakes the nurse up? Nobody wakes the nurse up. Well, I'll give her the alarm clock. <laughs> Jimmy, for the last time, cut out the comedy. This is a very worrying business. I don't know what your mother will think about it. But my mother doesn't know anything about the accident. I told Mrs. Peters over the road to ring her up at the hairdresser. <laughs> Madame, Today, I give to you the special coiffure. All I want is a shampoo and set. Oh, Mrs. Slytherin, please. No, 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 no. You are too conservative. The man, as she comes in here, now, I give to her a sweep. You know, with the curls piled high on top of the head, yeah? Oui? And masses of curls piled high on the head, yeah? And what is the result? Nobody will sit behind her in the pictures. <laughs> Oh, madame, please, you joke, yes. No, 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 no. She, she, listen, please, to me. She is a different woman. Yeah. Yes, I make a new style. Now, please, madame, just for you. Tight curls in front, windswept sides, a loose, provocative curl, a blonde streak. Hmm? We come. Let us be daring. <laughs> Let us be cheeky. Let us be abandoned. I hope you're still talking about my hair. <laughs> oh, may we, madame. Look, the last time I style your hair, you look so glamorous. Yeah, maybe you think so. I think you overdid it. I didn't like the way the milkman kept on looking at me. <laughs> I just have a shampoo and set. Ah, uh, maybe. Very well, the shampoo and set. I just put a pin here. Another one there. Yeah, what is it, Millie? Oh, for Mrs. Clizzle? Ah, well, bring the extension over here, please. Uh, Mrs. Clizzle, telephone for you, madame. Oh, thanks. Hello. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Peters. Yeah. What? Susan in hospital? Jimmy's bike? Oh, the poor girl. They've gone down there? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I I I'll go right away. Thanks, Mrs. Peters. Here we are. Come on, Jim. Ah, there it is. That's the reception office over there. Oh, Grandad, that taxi driver didn't half give you a dirty look. He was expecting a tip, wasn't he? He was, but he didn't get one. Five and six to come down here. Daylight robbery, that's what it is. Anyway, why should I give him a tip? He was only doing his job. I don't tip the coalman when he brings the coal. No, but who wants to ride in a coal cart? <laughs> oh, come on. Let's go and make some inquiries about our Susan. Hey, hey, Grandad. Look who's over there. Alfie Hall. Alfie? Where? Over there. Carrying those books and magazines. He'll know where Susan is. Alfie! Alfie Hall! Hey, cloth ears! <laughs> oh, hello, Jimmy. Yeah, hello, Mr. Sinclair. Well, what have you come to the hospital for? I should have thought that that was obvious. We want to see our Susan. Yes, you said on the phone she'd be in the casualty ward. Oh, she was, but she just got into the operating theatre. Why? Is there a Sean? <laughs> That'll do, Jimmy. But anyway, I can't stand here gossiping. I'm in a hurry. Gossiping? Listen, when she went into the theatre, how did she look? Ah, uh, just the same as usual. Beautiful. 
<laughs> well, did she say anything? No, no. She just borrowed a fag off me and went in, puffing away. <laughs> Get any road. I- I've got to go now. ta da Granddad, did you hear that? She was smoking a cigarette. Aye, that's bravery for you. It's the Scottish ancestry that does it. But you're always telling us she shouldn't smoke. Well, this is different. When it's a question of sickness, I don't object to smoking. What? The only time I ever smoked, I was sick. And you tell me... That was different altogether. <laughs> oh, look. There's the operating theatre. Over there, through that door. Oh, uh... Excuse me, nurse. What are you doing? You can't come in here. I'll talk to you outside. Who are you, anyway? He's me granddad. Well, he can't come into the operating theatre. Uh, we're inquiring about a patient nurse. Uh, uh, Mr. Alfred Hall told us she was brought in here from the casualty ward. Oh, yes, Mr. Hall. Uh, he said he was acquainted with the lady. Ah, yes. Well, you see, we're relatives of hers. Oh, you are. Well, before she went under the anaesthetic, she had quite a lot to say about her relations. If it hadn't been for you, this accident would never have happened. Yes, uh, we understand. But, but you see... Letting her go up her ladder like that. Ladder? No wonder she had an accident. Fancy riding a bike up a ladder. <laughs> bike? She said she fell off a ladder. Poor lassie. Oh, she must have been delirious. Uh, uh, what did you say about her relatives? Well, she mentioned her brother in no uncertain terms. Her, her brother? Yes. She blames the whole thing on him. She says from now on she's finished with him. Oh, I suppose that means she won't lend me any more elastic for me catapult. <laughs> Shimmery. Yes, and she also mentioned a waster of a man who sat around the house waiting for her to fetch and carry for him. Two lazy to lift a finger to help himself. Grandad, she remembered you as well. <laughs> well, now, if you don't mind, I'm busy. But, uh, nurse, could you know just tell us how she is? Uh, well, if you'll wait here, I'll go and speak to the doctor. Uh, thank you, n- nurse. Oh, uh, Dr. Jackson, about the patient from Casualty Ward. Uh, who, Miss Chenwick? Oh, uh, she's gone back to Casualty. I told them to put her in the side ward. Here are the papers. Oh, thank you. Uh, was that Miss Clitheroe with her? Yes, but she's gone to look up an old work friend of hers in maternity. Oh. Well, that girl did a good job looking after the old lady. Uh, by the way, I've got two of Miss Chadwick's relatives outside inquiring about her. Well, it's all down there in the case papers. I'd like very much to have a word with them myself. I, uh, I took the liberty of telling them off. I hope you don't mind. Oh, not in this case, nurse, no. Uh, send them down to casualty. I'll give them my views of their conduct down there. Oh, and would you find that chap Hall for me? He should be able to tell me all about this useless family of Miss Chadwick's. He lives next door to them. Very good, Doctor. Uh, Well, nurse, have you any news for us? Well, all I can tell you is she's in with a broken leg and severe shock. The doctor's attended to her and sent her to casualty. You'll find her in the side ward, but she won't be conscious yet. Now, please, would you go? I'm busy. You know, Jim, it's a very sad day for us. Very sad indeed. Jimmy, keep your thieving hands out of those grapes. Well, I'm hungry. I've had no dinner. Look, you wait here for me. I'm going to look for a phone to ring the hairdressers and find out when your mother left. I thought she would have been here by now. Ah, what is it? Inquiries. It's all right, all right. There's no need to ring like that. What do you want? I want to see my daughter. She's had an accident. Which ward is she in? What's her name? Susan, come on, please. Take me to her. What's her surname? Same as mine, of course. But you haven't told me your name. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, um, it's Susan Clitheroe. One moment, please. I'll check the admissions. Mr. Stockford, Mr. Leed, Miss Chadwick. No, I've no record of a Miss Clitheroe. But you must have. She came in here on a broken down old bike. I beg your pardon? <laughs> I, 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 I mean, she had an accident on a bike. I'm sorry, but there must be some mistake. Now, look here. My daughter's been brought here this afternoon. Madam, the only female admitted this afternoon was Miss Chadwick. Well, that must be her. You've got the name wrong, that's all. It's Clitheroe. Most unlikely. It definitely says Never it. mind what it says. Where did this Miss Chadwick go? Well, she was admitted to the casualty ward. Good, at last I'm getting somewhere. Now, how do I get there? Well, you go out of here, turn left at physiotherapy, straight past mass radiography and right at rehabilitation. What? <laughs> 
<laughs> Look, just write... No, draw it. Draw it on a bit of paper for me. Go on. Oh, all right. Wait a minute. Oh, a fine hospital this is. Girl comes in here, disappears. Nobody knows who she is, where she is. There's no proper record of her complaint. All right, mm. madam. There it is. Now, follow that line. Good. I'm going, but I'll have something to say. Something to say about this in the right place. I will of all the incompetent. Now, it just looks like I go round here, past the operating theatre. Hello, Mum. And then I... You're here at last. Jimmy Clitheroe, oh, I've got something to say to you about that bike. This is a fine method, no mistake. Yes, but, Mum... Don't but me. Have you any news of Susan? Oh, she's in a side ward, in that casualty place. Oh, good, come on, we're going right there now. Oh, what about Grandad? He's going to ring you up. He can follow us down. Oh, poor father, I bet he got an awful fright. He did. The taxi cost him five and sixpence. <laughs> I'm talking about Susan. Oh, I wonder if she's in much pain. Oh, no, 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 she isn't, ma'am. Oh, that's good. No, she's unconscious. <laughs> My goodness, how, how did it happen? Well, she said she fell off a ladder riding my bike. Oh, don't talk nonsense. She said it, not me. Grandad said she must have been delicious. <laughs> you mean delirious? Oh, oh, madam, I suppose you're another fond relative of Miss Chadwick. I'm Mrs... Oh, all right, Miss Chadwick. She's in this room here, but I'm afraid you can't go in yet. Why not? She's me on flesh and blood. Now you'll remember it. Thank you. Anyway, the doctor's in there at the moment with Mr. Hall. What? I'll let you know when you can come in. Mr. Hall? Hey, ma'am, she hasn't closed the door. Shall I have a peep? No, of course not. But there's no harm in us listening. I think she's still unconscious, doctor. Yes, but her pulse is all right. Uh, now, Mr. Hall, about this family of hers, uh, would you say they've driven her to it? Would they driven it to what? Well, look, old man, <laughs> I mean, let's, let's not beat about the bush. We both know what the trouble is. She's obviously a secret drinker. Well, I've, I've, I've heard rumours, but I didn't like to say. Well, it's perfectly obvious that she had one or two when the accident happened. Jimmy, did you hear that? Saying that about our Susan? Well, you must admit, Mum, the pubs were open when she left home. <laughs> I've got a good idea when she gets all the bills. I mean, you've already got to look at your mother. Yeah. <laughs> written all over her face, too. She did it right, real old soul. That's you, ma'am. <clears throat> you wait till I get hold of him. I'll take my shoe off and leave my footprints all over his head. Where does she live with these relatives, then? Well, you see, she's still scared to leave. That they're all there sponging on her and she dares even tell them she's secretly married. Susan? Married? Married? It's disgraceful. It is. I never even got a bit of wedding cake. Sponging on her, eh? Well, tell me, what about the old fellow? Hasn't he got a job? Yeah, I'm sure he's never done a day's work in his life. Oh, oh. If, if, if Grandad was here, he'd do the Highland fling on Alfie's bread basket. Well, just leave it to me, Mr. Hall. I'll deal with them. Yeah, right, old doctor. Uh, I'm going your way. I'll come with you. Yeah, well, I hope I've been able to help you. Oh, hello, Mrs. Clitheroe. I didn't know you were here. I'm sure you didn't. And also, come on. Driven out a drink, come on. Hold your foot up, ma'am. I'll take your shoe off. <laughs> What are you talking about? Out of my way, I'll deal with you as soon as I've had a look at our Susan. Oh, there you are, Mother. Grandad's told me about the mix-up. I'm perfectly all right. Yes, but Susan just came here to help Miss Chadwick. Oh, Susan, love you, say. Oh, I've nearly been out of bed. Hello, oh, because I've been looking. Well, uh, I think I'll just go for a walk for about a week. <laughs> Jimmy Clitheroe, every time anything happens, you make a mess of it. What is it about you that makes... Makes you get everything wrong. I don't know, ma'am. But whatever it is, it, it never fails. Radio England UK 2. Here is Jimmy Clitheroe as the Clitheroe Kid with Peter Sinclair, Patricia Burke, Danny Ross and Diana Day in... A Lovin' Has Been Arranged. Honestly, the stuff they advertise in some of these magazines. I'd like to meet the man who's selling peeping Tom spy glasses. Why do you want to buy one, Mum? <laughs> you were talking yourself into a real good hiding. You tell him, Mother. Him and his prying. The way he carries on, I think I'll get a padlock for my bedroom door. Get one for your mouth as well. 
Don't you be rude. And don't you be funny, or I won't tell you about the phone message I took for you. Now, don't you be cheeky. This is not some little kid you can be rude to at school. She's your sister. Now, say you're sorry. Yes, ma'am. Susan, I'm sorry you're my sister. I, <laughs> I was, I'm sorry I was rude to you. I right. Mean. Now, give her that phone message. Go on. Right, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Forrester rang and said he'd pick you up at 8 o'clock tomorrow night in his car. Who's Mr. Forrester? He's off again with his prying. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to know about your boyfriend, this fellow, Mr. Tree Chopper. <laughs> and I won't say a single word to Alfie, no matter how much he offers me. Ask me. Now, you listen to me, my lad. I'm going to say this once and once only. If I catch you prying into other people's affairs again, there'll be a good spanking, no telly, no pocket money, and no football for a whole month. Understand? Yes, ma'am. Now, get out of this room and behave yourself. Yes, ma'am. Just go in, ma'am. And no more asking questions about Mr. Forrester. No, ma'am. Go no, ma'am. Susan, who is this Mr. Forrester? <laughs> Oh, a friend of my boss. He's the man I babysit for on Wednesday night, so he can take his wife out. Oh, of course. Alfie works all time on Wednesday nights, doesn't he? That's right. So I go babysitting to pass the time and earn myself a bit of extra money. And what did Alfie say about all that? Oh, nothing. He doesn't know about it, actually. I was going to tell him, but I forgot. Oh. Mind if our Jimmy finds out, I won't need to tell anybody. It'll be on the front page of the Sunday papers. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going to teach Master James to start minding his own business. He was eavesdropping on me when I rang the chemist the other night. Oh, you mean when you had that sore throat? Yes. Yeah. And Mr. Evans, the chemist, said if I went round to his house, he'd fix me up with something to gargle with. But how did you know our Jimmy heard you? Because he told Mrs. Higginbottom I'd been round to Mr. Evans' house to get fixed up with a girdle. <laughs> Whatever I've told you tonight, I've never said a word. Well, my foreman had a few words to say. I was asking me to change my tea break at a quarter to eight. I'd only been at work three quarters of an hour. Three quarters of an hour? Without a tea break? Does your union know? You. <laughs> Look, don't be funny. You said you'd drag me out of our work because it was important and it was to do with Susan. Well, what is it? She's got herself another fella. Oh, is that all? Honestly, you go through all this trouble just because she's fella. Who? Oh. Ah, uh, Susan. What's the other about? Susan's not a fella. She's a girl. But you don't miss a thing, do you? No. <laughs> I'm not as daft as some people. I mean, um... What's his name? His name's Mr. Forrester. He takes our Susan out in his car every Wednesday night when you're working overtime. And then he fetches her home. Eventually. What do you mean, eventually? Well, last week it was still midnight when they woke me up. Uh, and the week before it was nearly one o'clock. Wait, Miss Horst. Yeah, how long has it been going on? Three weeks. How long have you been working overtime on Wednesday? Three weeks. Oh, no. no. I can't believe it. I won't. Hey, do you know what happens when he fetches her home? I mean, does he... Do they... <laughs> Mm. Did he stop in the... Did, does he stand with it behind the... Do, be, 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 what did he say to each other? We look at the garden and say, What pretty hollyhock! <laughs> How do I know what they say? It's cold this weather with my bedroom window open. Yeah. All right, all right, you and your jokes. For all I know, this is one of them. You're always up to your trick. Luke, it's just on eight o'clock. If we hide here in the street, I'll bet you two bob he comes for her in his car. Are you on? Yeah, no, I, I don't, no. I'm not making you no know, two bob. Oh, of course. You want to make it half a crown. Yeah, no. <laughs> Look, I'm warning you, Jimmy Clitheroe. Quick, behind these bushes. Ah, huh? come about myself. Luke, a car's just pulled up outside our house. Oh, so what? I mean, it could be anybody. <laughs> It's children's man. Luke, our Susan's come out of the house. He's got out of the car to open the door. Handsome, isn't he? She's got in. 
Now he got in, and off they drive round the corner, laughing and talking to each other. Now then, if he's an insurance man, what's his policy? <laughs> Well, you see, I was, I was, I was, I was working late last night, you know. Of course I know. What do you want? Well, I was, I was, well, I was, I was thinking it. Well, I mean, it's not much fun for you. What isn't? I don't know. I mean, you, you don't enjoy being stuck at home, do you? No, and I don't enjoy receiving idiotic phone calls at work, either. Why? Are they ringing you? <laughs> oh, look, get to the point. What do you want to say to me? Well, you see, if I hadn't been working last night, I'd have taken you out to somewhere special. <laughs> because you didn't go anywhere special last night, did, did you, Susan? Of course I didn't. Look, I'm going to hang up. Hang what up? Don't. Don't. I, 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 I want to speak to you. Well, I don't want to speak to you. Goodbye. Oh, I'll be like that. Goodbye. And good riddance. Yes, yeah, that's what she said when I spoke to her. I don't want to speak to you again. Good day and good riddance. <laughs> oh, brilliant. You've impersonated our Susan, now you're a human being. Yeah. Oh, sure, up. Can I say I'm all upset? Yes, Jim. Spare a thought for young Romeo here. Can't you see he's under a great emotional strain? <laughs> he's not the only one. I'm feeling a bit sad as well. Ah, uh, you, you mean because I won't be coming round here anymore, Jimmy? Yeah, I'll miss you, Alfie. Your happy, smiling face. Your funny little jokes. You shiny two bob pieces. <laughs> I'll settle for a lump sum, two pounds ten. Jim, Jim, don't be so mercantile. Look, <laughs> we've got to help the lad, so if you're going to talk, say something constructional. Oh, it's very nice of you to want to help, Mr. Whistle, but Susan said goodbye. And then she told me a lie. She said she never went out and she did. Oh, well, women are like that, Alfie. You can't understand them. They're what you call ungrammatical. There's only one man I ever knew who could plumb the depths of a woman's mind. Oh, it was he. A plumber. Now, oh, now, Jim. I was just thinking of a mate of mine on a road building job. He had woman coming, like young Alf here. His beard starts carrying on with a dustman. <laughs> or as we call him nowadays, a disposed refusal officer. <laughs> so, I picked you up with a bed near our digs. Charming, refined, ladylike. She was a car body sprayer in Luton. <laughs> I got one or two photos of the two of them holding hands in the local booter. Brought them home one weekend and showed them to his intentional. Well, that did it. She wrote saying it was all over with the dustman. He proposed matrimony. She got a torso ready for the big day. <laughs> On the first day of wedding bliss, she broke his fried egg and burnt his toast. He belted it with a frying pan. They lived happy ever after. <laughs> What a load of Liverpool rubbish. It's true, Jim, every word of it. And what I did for me, mate, we can do for Alfie. Get another bed to make Susan jealous. Get away. Where are we going to get a car body spare at this time of the night? It's hard then for once, will you? Look, Mr. Whittle, it's a good idea, but... Where are we going to find another girl who fancies me? Well, surely there must be... I mean, there's bound to be some girl... Yeah, see what you mean, Elsie. <laughs> Jimmy, come in here a minute. I've got an errand for you. Come in, ma'am. There's only one way you'll find another girl who fancy Elsie, Mr. Whittle. Uh, what's that, Jim? Find a girl with glasses and keep breathing on them. <laughs> ah, there you are, Jimmy. Is the Harry Whittle still waiting for me? Oh, yes, yeah, she's talking to Alfie. Uh, you know, they're talking private like, you know, wacker to wacker. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll see him in a few minutes. Your mother's got an evidence for you. Yes, Jimmy, it's the women's girl business. Uh, would you take this note round to Mrs. Cunliffe? She lives at uh, number 15, Poplar Grove. Poplar Grove? Where's that? You remember. 
You once broke a fella's window down there, and then got Alfie all mixed up with his daughter. Of course. Cuddly Connie Cleghorn. <laughs> She's just the girl. What for? For Alfie. I'll run down there right away. <laughs> Of course, fancy me forgetting Connie Cleghorn. Uh, Alfie didn't forget her. The way she chased after him, up and down Poplar Grove. Yeah, she wasn't very popular, was she? <laughs> <laughs> well, not when I was Susan, she wasn't. She went mad when she thought Alfie and Connie were carrying on together. Of course, couldn't be better. <laughs> what? Uh, I'll take me mum's letter. <laughs> Hello? Has anybody here seen Connie? Kay Oh, that fruit and jelly was smashing Miss Cleghorn. Oh, call me, call me. You make me feel old. Do you want to listen out to eat, Jimmy? Well, I shouldn't really. It'll spoil me tea, but I will have a bit more. Well, what would you like? Cream cake, biscuits, malt loaf, custard slice? Yes, please, and another cup of tea. <laughs> I think you're going to spoil your breakfast anyway. Go on, help yourself. Muck in. Thanks, Connie. You know, it's funny I happen to be passing your house, because I'll be always only talking about you today. Don't you mention that wolf to me. <laughs> the way he led me up the garden last year. Did he? What did he take you up the garden for? <laughs> Nothing worse, look. Oh, no, well, you see, it's just the saying that, you know. I mean, look, he was going out with your Susan, but he didn't stop me sitting on his knee. No, I remember you kept kissing him and he didn't smack your face once. <laughs> Are you being funny? Oh, no. Anyway, it's different now. Our Susan's finished with Alfie. She's got another boyfriend. That's she. And um, has Alfie got another girl? <laughs> of course not. What girl will gas that? Uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, no, no. Oh, poor Alfie. Oh, he must be lonely then, all on his own. Yeah, it's rotten. He has nobody to take out and spend his money on. And he doesn't like going out on his own. He's taken their cat to the pictures twice. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Oh, no, the cat enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, Tweety Fire was on. No, no. It's no joke, you know, Jimmy, being alone. I mean, we all want somebody to talk to, to hold your hand, or... Oh, a lovely handsome man to cuddle you. Oh, think I'll be a sooner have a girl. Look, I'll tell you the truth. That's why I came to your house. To fix it for you to meet Alfie. Oh, Jimmy. Alfie sent you round to speak for him. <laughs> You, I'm the only one who can understand him. <laughs> understand about you and him, I mean. Yeah. Oh, so you're our little Cupid, are you? I watch it. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, well, I said you were the only one who could make him happy again. Oh, do you know I could kiss you for hey, that? Hey, girl. <laughs> Look, can you be at his house at half past seven tonight? Oh, yes, yes. Do you know, Jimmy, you deserve something for being so nice. Here's two shillings. Oh, thanks, Connie. I didn't expect you to give me two shillings. Well, why not? I'll give you two shillings last time. Oh, no, you didn't. You gave me half a crown. <laughs> I'll tell Alfie when I take his hot milk up to him. Hello? Oh, what was that about, giving me hot milk? Well, Susan thinks you're ill. So she'll be around here in about five minutes, just in time to catch you with Connie. Aye, if Connie comes here. Oh, don't worry, she'll be here. When I told her you wanted to see us, she looked like a cat who just found out where the cream is. It's not half past seven yet. There you are. Your little tiddles has arrived. <laughs> Go in the lounge and make a noise like it's in a cream. Oh. <laughs> Jimmy, I, I don't think I want to see Connie after all. You what? 
If we don't open that front door, you'll be wearing it for a colour. <laughs> but Susan, I get mad at me. That's the idea, isn't it? You want to make her jealous. That's what Mr. Whittle said. You better oh, very well, but he doesn't know, Connie. But I'm scared of him. Ooh, I wish Mr. Whittle was here instead. Don't be daft. Susan won't be jealous of you and Mr. Whittle. You. <laughs> instead of me, I mean. It's too late to back out now. I'm opening the door. All you've got to do is to let Connie sit on your knee for a couple of minutes till Susan arrives, and then Susan will hit you with the frying pan, and you'll live happy ever after. Uh, that's just it. You'll probably kill me. Don't worry, I'll make sure the frying pan's empty. <laughs> oh, good, it's you. Uh, come in, Connie. Oh, thank goodness. I thought the house was empty. You know, I thought Alfie didn't really want to see me after all. Oh, don't be silly. He's been getting himself ready for the last half hour. Washing his hair, combing his face. He's, a, he's in the lounge. Come in. Alfie, this is Connie. Oh, yeah, hello, Connie. <laughs> uh, could come in and sit on my knee for a minute. But I sit, 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 uh... <laughs> yeah, sit, sit down, I mean, until the fried pan comes. Uh, sit down. <laughs> And I said, tell her to put the kettle on the name. Oh, Alfie, oh, you're a fast worker. I've seen me to sit on your knee before I've even got my coat on. I'm sorry, Connie, I wasn't thinking. Okay, can I take your coat and hat? No. You make him set my coat. You can set the rest of me on your knee. Oh, chubby cheek. <laughs> No, you have to not so she's here. But he's here, I mean. But do you can't sit on mine. What, what, what about Jimmy? Oh, she's too big to sit on mine, eh? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to the front door to uh, uh, get some fresh air. Ah, well, get some for me. Yeah, but I mean, I think I'll get some. Yeah. Let, let's all get some. Don't be daft. Have you forgotten why you asked Connie to come over? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Connie. Sit down and take them off. You're cool tonight. <laughs> boy. Come on, lean back and let's get comfy. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, just a bit, 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 bit. Don't, don't you think it's cold? I'll, I'll go and put the kettle on for a cup of tea. If you get any ready, you can put the kettle on your face. Now, come on. <laughs> don't be silly, I'll be <laughs> Now, listen, you don't need me to warm you when I'm here. <laughs> no, from the look of things, by the time you know who gets here, our Vikings will have melted. <laughs> Seconds out, go into a clean shop and get ready to come out fighting. Oh, I do hope it isn't anybody for you, Alpha. If it is, I'll tell him to call back when his knees are empty. <laughs> Hey, Jimmy, be careful what you say. <laughs> Hello, Sue. Come in. Is Alfie feeling any better? Well, I think his temperature's gone up in the last few minutes. Oh, dear. Has he been to the doctor? Uh, no, but he's getting the treatment. <laughs> he's in the lounge here. Go in. He should be upstairs. Alfie Hall, why aren't you in bed? Oh, charming, I must say. <laughs> Yes, yes, Susan. She just came round for a while to, uh... Yeah, sit on his knee. Sit on my knee. No. <laughs> Look, you think she just happened to be passing and called him for a... A cuddle. A cuddle. A cuddle. <laughs> yeah, but a, cu a cup of tea, but we didn't have one because she warmed me up. Dram <laughs> it. Look, why explain anything to her? I mean, you and Miss Clither are all finished. We certainly are. I'm sorry I interrupted your little tete a -tete. Hey, you, watch what you're saying. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Susan. I mean, there's, there's no need to go just because Connie was on my knee. Oh, no, she'll move up. There's room for two. <laughs> well, then you started your funny remark. You're the one who got me here with your lies. Well, it worked. Hang on, I'll get you the frying pan to clout Alfie. Oh, yes, Susan, if you're jealous, you can hit me. You go on. Hit me. Jealous? Have you? You can see it, eh? Oh, don't you call my sweetie pie or I'll slot you on. <laughs> what 
don't worry. I'll never mention his name again. I hope you and Sweetie Pie are very happy. You deserve each other. <laughs> and good riddance to bad rubbish. At girl called Susan, bad rubbish. No, for rubbish, she's not bad at all. <laughs> I wouldn't have believed Alfie could do that to you, Susan. I felt such a fool walking in on him like that. <laughs> well, he gave Connie a bit of a shock. <laughs> she nearly fell off Alfie's knee. <laughs> oh, shut up, you. It was your lies about Alfie being ill that got me round there. I only did what I was told. Well, do what I tell you, for once. Mind your own business. Well, I was only trying to get Susan to go out with Alfie again. What are you talking about? You hadn't stopped going out with Alfie, had you, Susan? Of course she hadn't. She'd stopped going out with him on Wednesdays. Wednesday? Alfie's been working over every Wednesday. Of course he has. That's why Susan's been babysitting for the Foresters. Exactly. Alfie was working, so she was... Babysitting? <laughs> yes, babysitting. Oh, why do you think Mr. Forrester's been calling for me in his car and bringing me home late every week? Well, I thought uh, you've uh, been babysitting. What is all this? Oh, uh, just answer the door on my way out. I've got to go and see Alfie. Ozzy, I mean. You're not going to see Ozzy at this time of night. Yeah, oh, hello, Jimmy. Susan in. I'm going to go down on my knees and say I'll forgive her. That I've changed her to forgive me knees. Me, I mean, hold on. <laughs> Not now, Alfie. Come back later. When? About ten years later. Oh. Get out of my way. I'm, 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 I'm going in if she kills me. Well, I'm going out before she kills me. Hey, Susan, Susan. Yeah, I've come out to tell you the truth. Oh, heck. I wonder what the chances are of getting a lift to Australia. Hello there. Hello there, my little whacker. I was just coming down to your ancestral home. Mr. Whittle, let me give you some advice. Before you go in, make your will. What? I don't get it. You will if you go in there. <laughs> Alfie took your advice about making Susan jealous, only it didn't work. Now she's making mincemeat of Alfie, and I'm the next on the menu. Well, uh, what went wrong? Was that you, the uh, Connie? Wasn't she the right bait? Alfie was the bait. Connie turned out to be an octopus. <laughs> Jimmy, is Alfie in your house? Oh, speak of the devil. And up pops his sister. <laughs> Don't let her go in there, Mr. Whittle. Do you know, he dashed out to their house and on three months about before I could move. What, with you still on his knee? Oh, don't be so funny. I thought he'd come here and I was right there at his bank. Oh, no, that's Mr. Whittle's. This is Mr. Whittle. Mr. Whittle, uh, this is Connie. And don't tell mine. Oh, no, no, no. Jimmy's not prefabricating. Uh, <laughs> I am, uh, I am Harry Whittle. Uh, and you must be the lovely Miss Connie I've heard about. Oh, right here. Yeah. Oh, nothing too bad, I hope. On the contrary, uh, you've been recommended to <laughs> been recommended most highly. Oh, thanks. Oh. Ah, you're still there. Jimmy, come in here this minute. How was it? Just going to Aussies for a month. Um, a minute. Get in this house while you're still able to walk. Yes, Grandad. I'm coming. Try and get rid of Cuddly Connie, Mr. Whittle. Get in there, you little scamp. Oh, honest Grandad, I was only trying to help out here. My friend. With a friend like you, he'll never need an enemy. Oh, there you are, troublemaker. You little liar. Will you never learn to mind your own business? Go on, pick up me. What about Wacker Rotten Whittle? What's he got to do with it? It was his idea. He was the Fagin and I was just the Oliver Twister. 